Hi, Pastor Matt here. Thank you so much for um, either streaming or downloading this sermon. I, I pray that every week you're challenged by the Word of God. You're, you're built up in His love. The Word of God kind of gets in you and rearranges things and draws your affections up to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I want to remind you, as always, uh, that although, man, I'm I'm so glad that that you want to hear what what I've got to say this week or we've got to say this week. Th this is never never meant to substitute God's good plan for you to be in a community of faith where the word of God is preached and proclaimed. And so I wanna encourage you to use this like a vitamin, not like a meal, uh, so that you belong to a community of faith where you're being shaped by being known, by using your gifts, by receiving the word, by partaking in the sacraments, and by walking faithfully in accordance with the scriptures. And then this is something, man, you're listening to while you run or you're, you're watching when you have a few minutes. And so just wanna make sure we, we frame what this is and what it should not be. Now, with that said, uh, one of the things that the Village Church wants to do is the things that are created here by the grace of God, man, we wanna give those away. That's podcasts and vodcasts, that's family discipleship curriculum, that's Bible study curriculum, like what we've, what we've tried to do for over a decade is just whatever we create here, we wanna give away. And so to do that though, we rely on the donations and generosity of those who, who believe in what we're doing and who have benefited from the things that have been created here. And so here, before you dive into what I'm sure is gonna be a 45, 50 minute uh, sermon, uh, I just wanted to encourage you, if you have grown, if you have benefited um, from our resources, would you consider being a part of the team that helps this engine continue uh, to produce and create biblical, creative, and practical discipleship curriculum uh, for men and women of all ages and all stations? And so, man, if you'd pray about that and consider that, um, that, would, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. Enjoy the word of God proclaimed. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. Uh, I have this uh, pretty vivid memory uh, of my mom and dad dropping me off uh, at a small Baptist church in the Bay Area uh, that was right outside the base that my father was stationed. Um, I don't know if they were doing that. Uh, for babysitting purposes. I, I'm not sure why, but, but got dropped off. And, and we had this big group time. And if you've been here 10 years, I've told this story before, but I've only got one life. This is all I got. I've just got the stuff I've got. And so sorry. Um, and, and it's big group time. And they're starting to like play this song that's meant to get all the kids hype. And, and so they like handed out instruments. I don't know if you remember this, but there was like a stick with bells. on. It was like a reindeer stick. And then there was little finger symbols. Uh, and it was this really kind of upbeat, chipper song about how God hates liars. And, and in the middle, I, I mean, I, I had the stick, right? The reindeer stick. And, I was, and then it just occurred to me, hey, w wait, what? Like I'm, I'm, I'm singing a chipper song about how God hates me. Uh, and I could give you that story and about 40 other stories uh, about kind of a, a moral approach to Christianity that's inconsistent with the God of the Bible. Um, see, what, what I have found is that uh, more often than not, Christians understand, Christians understand the Christian story through the lens of morality. Uh, all right, they, they, they approach the Bible uh, with morality. And what I mean by that is these are the things I'm supposed to do and these are the things I'm not supposed to do. And that's what Christianity is. Uh, and yet the other way, in fact, I would argue the correct way and God help us the way that most people miss is actually a redemptive understanding of Christianity. And so here, here would be uh, the redemptive lens. Um, let, let me put it maybe right in the middle of 2019. Uh, let's just pretend we're binge watching a show. Uh, all right. And so there, there's a new show coming out. It's called Redemption. Bum, bum, bum. Not Justified. I know that's already been done. Redemption. And uh, you watch the trailer and man, the music's amazing. All the pieces. That's your favorite actor. That's your favorite actress. The cinematography looks amazing. So you order your life. I'm going to binge this whole show. But you're not sure you have time. So you're like, I'm just going to try the first one and see what happens. And so you watch episode one and episode one is called Creation. And so you're sitting there on the couch and, and man, out of nothing, burst forth everything and it's good and it's beautiful and it's right. And you find like your soul is 
aching as you watch this thing come about. I mean, out of nothing, everything. And, and there's this man and this woman, your favorite actor and actress, and, and man, they are in love. And it's the kind of love that just makes your heart ache and long and desire. And when that episode is over, you ain't going to bed, right? They already got you. They've got that next episode starts in five seconds. And so you're like, tomorrow will be rough, but I'm in. And, and episode two was called Fall. Right? And you're probably, oh, they're going to fall deeper in love. They're going to fall. And, and except what happens is episode two is like Empire Strikes Back. Spoiler alert, everything goes wrong. And Vader turns out to be Luke's dad. If you didn't know that, that's on you. Uh, and so uh, episode two, everything unravels, right? Everything that was beautiful in episode one is now broken. The beauty of creation, broken. This love relationship, broken. Everything broken. And now, you ain't going to bed uh, because, right, the next episode starts in five seconds. And, and episode three is called Reconciliation. And so you're like, oh my gosh, what's, what's this one about? And you're stress eating now. And, and, and so, right, and, and, and then this is about things being put back together. Right? It's this weird kind of, there's this other person who comes in, he starts putting everything back together. He takes the man and the woman, he, he puts them back together, but not before he puts them back into their design. And he starts taking what was fractured, he starts to fix it again. And, and man, you can, you can feel like you're, you're tearing up now, right? But so, so you're like, this is unbelievable. And so now, man, let, let's just... We're calling in sick tomorrow, right? It's two in the morning, one more episode. It's only an hour and 30 minutes, so let's do it. And you watch the last episode, and the last episode is called Consummation. And the last episode is not everything being put back the way it was in the beginning, but it being made more beautiful and more grand than we could even imagine. And the credits roll, and you're sad about it because it was the, the most perfect story ever. And, and now it's over, and now all you have is like the new Daredevil one coming out in a couple of weeks, and, and so you're not even sure what to do next. Now, th that is the story of reality. Are you tracking with me? So the story of reality is a creator God who creates everything good, right, and beautiful. And sin is interested in the cosmos, and it fractures all of it. And God doesn't move from his creation. That moment. He moves towards them in the sending of the Son. And Jesus reconciles people back to the Father and, in the end, consummates all things. Now, if you're looking at life through the moral lens, God expects a certain level of behavioral um, Lining up, and I better do that. And if I don't do that, then God's going to be really angry, right? That view of things, look at me, is categorically false. There is a moral vision in the Bible. It's not to be skirted by. It's not to not be considered. It's just not the main point. And if the lenses by which you're understanding the Christian faith, the lenses by which you come to the Bible are moral lenses and not that you've been invited into the only story that actually is, the only story that defines reality. I'm trying to tell you, you're going to get stuck living half-hearted existences where you're constantly running into a ceiling and can't figure out why. Let me give you my sentence. This is what I want you to leave with. Ready? And I know, especially if you've got a church background, today could be awfully discombobulating. But, but I have, we have prayed and sought the Lord's face all week that maybe he would give you categories to walk into what he purchased for you by his blood. Here, here's my sentence. You cannot, you cannot do life for Jesus without doing life with Jesus. Do you hear me? You just can't do it. So the moral vision that you see in the Bible, you cannot do that without being with him. You cannot live the Christian faith without Jesus. It is not a moral vision. It is something deeper. That's a relational. It is a redemptive vision. And the reason so many of us just find this thing at times to be life-sucking is we're approaching it with lenses and with categories that the Bible doesn't make preeminent. You tracking with me? Okay, with that said, let's dive into the text. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to pick it up in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, 
even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. If you've got a church background, you'll, you'll be able to pick up here, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I think it's important that you notice right out of the gate Paul's motivation. So what's driving the apostle forward, right? What is the compulsion behind Paul's missionary zeal and love for Jesus? The compulsion that's driving him forward is love. So, so this word compulsion in the Greek, it's actually a quite common verb used in the New Testament. It means to hold together, to hold fast, to press around. It means to drive forward. In almost every place it's used, it connotes pressure or shaping or forming. Maybe a good word picture is what happens to coal under the ground. It just is pressed until it turns into a diamond. That's the language that's being used here. And Paul says, what's driving me forward, it's not guilt, it's not shame, it's not fear, it's the love of Christ that compels me. He's saying within the context of these seven verses that it doesn't matter what anybody says about him or thinks about him. He's being driven forward by a very specific love. Now, how freeing would that be? How freeing would it be to live in such a way that you actually don't care what people think about you or say about you? Listen, and I'll, I'll just out any alphas in here. The more a man or woman's like, I don't care what anybody says about me, the more they do. All right, that's just like a real kind of heart cry for validate me, right? I don't care what anybody says. It means I deeply care. Say something nice about me when I'm done with this rant. <laughs> All right, it's just posturing. It's just posturing. Because if you really didn't care, you don't need to say that, right? I just want all y'all to know I don't care. Okay, well, if you don't care, why do you need us to know that? Right? It's a, it's a game. So what's compelling Paul, what's driving him forward is love. So think about your Christian life. Think about your understanding of the kingdom of God. What is it that motivates you and drives you? Is it fear? Is it guilt? Is it shame? Do you believe that God's perpetually disappointed in you? Or does the love of Christ compel you? And he gives a little key on just how powerful this love is in the next sentence when he says, one has died, therefore all has died. Well, that's an illusion, not an illusion. He's just straight up pointing to Jesus Christ. He, he's saying that in the death of Christ, all of us who are in Christ died and you can't punish dead people. Like if somebody's dead, what are you physically gonna do to them? Are you just gonna punch a dead guy in the head? He's not gonna care. So Paul's argument here is that in the death of Jesus Christ, everyone who actually believes in Jesus Christ has all of their sins absorbed by Christ so that none remain. I usually talk about this in communion, that all of your sins, past, present, and future, have been handled. Now that's a profound kind of love. Isn't it? It's a kind of love that says, you're awkward, this is an awkward stage, and I'm crazy about you. Gosh, you are not smart, and I am wild about you. Man, the more I bless you, the more you feel entitled and you want to take rather than worship. Man, I'm crazy about you. That's, that's a crazy kind of love, is it not? I mean, that, that challenges parental human love, doesn't it? And yet, the God of the Bible, who clearly lays before us a moral vision for life, says that you will not fulfill that moral vision without being with me. You cannot live for me and not be with me. So Paul says, I am compelled by radical love because I am convinced that one died for all, therefore all have died. He says it this way in Galatians, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives for me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. Do you hear it? Do you hear that? I'm dead, 
So my, my, the sinful part of me died with Jesus on the cross. So I'm compelled by his love. I'm driven forward. I'm surrounded. I'm pressed. I'm, I'm motivated by his love. Not my guilt, not my fear, not my shame, by love. I'm driven forward by love. Now, I want you to hear me say this. It's important to return to these two ideas of a moral lens and a redemptive lens. If you possess the moral lens, and hear me, uh, if you grew up in church, you, you far, this is a far more dangerous thing for you than, than maybe if you didn't. But, but oftentimes I find people who didn't feel like God's just always angry at them too, right? But, but in this space, if you have the moral lens, you, you're not going to walk and spend and be with Christ because you're going to feel like you're perpetually disappointing him and he's constantly mad at you because you stink at being good, Right? Like, you, you want to do good. You try to do good. Gosh, how many times have you swore never again, only to again? How many times have you swore that not this time, only to go, oh, yeah, this time and the next and the next? And yet, wave upon, where, where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. That's what's happening right now, right? It's discombobulating because so many of us grew up in a, in a day and age where the preaching was so moral, and it's not wrong that it was moral. It's just the wrong lens. God cares about morals. We just can't get there without abiding with Jesus. So if you have moral lenses, it's going to twist everything. So let me, let me show you ultimately that God does care uh, about external morality and how we live our lives. So being motivated or compelled by love actually leads to a transformed life. Let's pick up Paul in verse 15. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Let, let's chat about this. I'm, th this one sentence that compelled by love because one died for all, therefore all died. So we've been set free to no longer live for ourselves, but to the one. Th this is a violent sentence in the face of the day and age in which you live. Right, What you and I are told from the second we can breathe in the modern air is whatever your heart wants is tied to your personhood and you better do that and, and don't let anybody stop you from stepping into who you're meant to be. And it's just a load of garbage. I, don't, I could say it stronger, but I don't want to offend. It's garbage. It's untrue. Right? Throughout human history, people have understood their compulsions that should not be given free reign in our lives. Like we, we live in a day where all boundaries are, are seen as oppressive, right? If there's a boundary or a rule, that's oppressive. It's causing me trauma. The only way for me to be truly me is to say yes to everything I want to do. And if you want to look around at the disintegration of society, you need only look to that lie, that narrative, no rules, no authority. I do what I want whenever I want because I need to be truly me and I can't not be truly me. And the only way to be truly me is to give into all my compulsions. Right? And he's saying here, no, no, no. I want to set you free from living for yourself. So I've said this for a long time now. The most miserable people on earth, the most anxious and angry people on earth are people who live simply for themselves. Impossible to have any kind of deep relational connection if you're the apex of existence, right? Why? Because everybody else has to serve your ends, right? You, you want a terrible marriage, you have one person in that marriage think they're the point of it. I'm just being straight, right? Like if you have a, a husband or a wife or you have somebody in the friend group that goes, the point of everything we're doing is my self-autonomy and me becoming everything that I'm meant to be, which means I get to do whatever I want whenever I want to do it. It is impossible to be rooted and connected in a way that actually brings life and it makes you angry and miserable because here's what's crazy. Nobody else in the world thinks you're the point. They think they're the point. So when everybody thinks they're the point, you know what you have? You have an age of outrage, don't you? Like, why are people freaking out on the freeway while they're driving? Why is everybody melting down all the time? Well, because we have been discipled. We have steeped in an age that says, I'm the point. And when the universe reminds us we're not, we're angry. It infuriates me that you don't understand that it's about me. And it infuriates you that I don't understand that it's about you. This is what we've been discipled in. This is why everything's falling apart. 
And here comes the love of Christ going, I'm going to set you free from that. I'm going to set you free from knowing you're not the point. I'm going to show you that I'm the point, and everything's going to be rightly ordered when you understand I'm the, the point. And it, it frees us while it discombobulates us in, in a very real way. So, in fact, even I want you to see how this even affects our relationship with others. But let me, let me read this sentence. My life and identity compelled by love have produced an allegiance to the kingdom of God in me that has externally marked my life. Did you follow that? So compelled by the love of Christ. Christ loves me. God has reconciled me. He is for me, not against me. I'm being compelled by love, not like I better get my act together before he lights me up. I better get things straight before he destroys me. Man, I better do things so that he can see that I'm a good person. He might bless my work, my marriage, my relationship with my kids, my money, my right. It's not that. It's compelled by the love of Christ. I've been set free to gaze upon his beauty and that begins to reorient my life, to value what he values and to love what he loves as I'm with him, not trying to work for him. And then look what it does to our relationships. He he says, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view or according to the flesh. And so now now not only are, are we reconciled to God and God is the point, we're not the point. Now all of a sudden our horizontal relationships start straightening out. I don't view anyone from a worldly point of view, a fleshly point of view, like I once viewed Christ. What's Paul talking about here? Paul thought Jesus was the problem. Super religious, super moral, despised Jesus. Thought Jesus would lead people away from the the path of life that God had so clearly laid out in the Old Testament. And so Paul saw Jesus as the enemy, the one that was going to rob him people of life, rob people of eternity, rob people of joy. And so Paul Saul set out to destroy the church and destroy Christians. And and he's saying, hey, we all do that. We all look at Christ and go, Christ is going to take from me. He's not going to give to me. Christ is going to rob from me what I really want. He's not going to grant to me real, deep, meaningful life. This is, again, the lie that's been around since the garden. Since the serpent whispered to Eve, this has been the lie. He's not good. He doesn't care for you. You would be better on your own. Right? And, and so what now is happening in the passage is he's saying we don't regard Christ like that anymore and therefore we don't regard others like that anymore, which means we understand that our enemies aren't flesh and blood, which is increases our capacity to be empathetic and loving and kind to broken people. See, if, if you view Christianity through the lens uh, of morality alone, then there's an in and there's an out based on morality and not on the finished work of Jesus Christ. So he's saying we no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. What that means is when I see people, I don't see their sin, but I see the grace of Christ pursuing and running after to welcome in. Was Jesus' critique of the Pharisees not you set up walls and boundaries that make it difficult for people to get into the kingdom? Moral lenses create hurdles and obstacles for people far from God to come into the kingdom of God. Redemptive lenses see the opportunity to invite all into the kingdom. This is why Paul was so heaven-bent on talking about how, how, how lost he was and how bad he was and how he was the chief of all sinners. It was his way of going, there's no way you're out because I'm not out. Right? Like, you're in because I'm in. Like, let this encourage you. I persecuted the church. I was a blasphemer. I murdered Christians and grace was afforded to me. What have you done to out the cross of Christ if I'm in? It changes our perspective of of what's ultimate, changes our perspective of other people, and none of this can be accomplished through moral lenses. Moral lenses let me know that you have fallen short and and I have fallen short, and we're all in a lot of trouble. And then look at where he goes after this. Pick it up in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, th- this is staggering because he's showing you how tied to withness, that's what Augustine called it, withness 
human flourishing and the moral vision in the Bible being uh, lived out, how closely they're related and tied, which is why I'm saying you can't live for Jesus without Jesus. Paul's arguing here that the energy, the force, the, the gumption to live out the moral vision of the Bible comes with being reconciled to God. Right, so, so this text is just full of withness. That's what Augustine called it. It's just a cool word, withness. And so it, it makes it sound like you're cool, but that's not really what's going on in the passage. So, so, so what you've got here is, is you've got um, a reconciliation that's occurring, and that's the point of the passage. There's been a reconciliation, and the reconciliation is not a moral one, but a relational one. Right? Did you see it? Like you were reconciled to God in Christ. Do we need to read it again together? I know it's a, it's a long weekend. We're, we're just like already a little tired. Let me read it again. Especially verse 16. All this is from God who reconciled us to what? To himself. So that the thrust of our vision for human flourishing and this moral path that God's laid before us has everything to do with being reconciled to God in Christ. What God is after is a relational connection with you and I that leads to a transformed life filled with the Holy Spirit, setting us free to live for God and not for ourselves that then lines us up with life as it was meant to be lived. So let me show you that. Well, let me, no, we've got to cover this one. Let me do a little MRI real quick, just a little spiritual check on how we're doing. Um, Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Now, here's what I mean by MRI. If this is true and you've been reconciled to God in Christ relationally, and it's that witness, being in the presence of Jesus, exercising that witness that ultimately transforms us. This, kind of, this passage is one of those that lays across the soul and sees whether or not we understand it. So, so let, we'll do this exercise. It might be weird for some of you, but this will help you feel more comfortable here. You don't need to grab your stuff or anything. You're safe. Uh, close your eyes for me for a second. Let's use our redeemed imagination. Uh, let, let's imagine God on his throne. So whatever he, like, let's just imagine, like God is sitting on the throne. If you know some of your Bible, you'll start to get these weird seraphim around him. You're, he's on his throne though. In all his eminence and all his transcendence, all his power, there's Christ. And he's gazing uh, across the expanse of his creation. And then he turns his gaze upon you. And he sees the thoughts of your heart, the motivations of your mind, And he doesn't look away, he just stares. What's his face look like? Is he disappointed? Frustrated? Trying to figure out when you're gonna get your act together? Like, like what's the response of Jesus towards you now? Uh, okay, look up at me. I, I say this a lot, I'm just gonna say it until he, he calls me home. God is not just in love with some future version of you, right? It's you right now that's just so hard for us, and yet that's everything that's going on, that witness reconciled to himself. You now, not you better 10 years from now, you, you now. And that if we are with him, if we have been reconciled to him and, and with him, we, we are welcomed in his presence, and we are even celebrated in our awkwardness. It, those of you who have children, your children go through these awkward stages, right? And it's not at that stage that they really bother you, right? It's like, oh, he's so awkward. I just can't stand this kid. I'll be back when they can take care of themselves. In fact, you can find in your heart in those stages a, a move towards, like, like a, a heightened sense of love, a desire to protect, a desire to come alongside, a desire to provide, a desire to keep safe. And, and this withness, this is about God drawing near in our awkwardness, in our sin, in our doubt, in our fears, in our struggle, and coming alongside. And, and I love how Beth Moore put this passage. He knows it's scary to be us. And, and I think what you do with that shows really, in a real sense, what lenses you have on your face. So if your life is perpetually marked by, God, I'm such a disappointment to God. There's just no way he's going to bless me. I just know at any moment now I'm going to be exposed as the big giant fraud I am. 
Right? Like if that keeps you up at night, that I'm just, I love you. That's a problem. Because here, here's a better way to view that. Look at me. I am a fraud. I am a fraud. I do doubt more than I wish I did. I do wrestle more than I wish I would. I, I do fall short more than I find that there are things that I think are dead in me and it only takes the right circumstances for what I thought was long gone and dead in me to flare up and be as strong as I ever thought it was. Anybody else? Right, so, so like one of my favorite responses to aggressive, unfair critique is, that's it? That, that's, you just think I'm, oh, I am far worse than that. Like if you were closer, if you could get closer in orbit, I'd be far more disappointing than what you're ex- explaining there. Right, so I don't even need to hide. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I ain't wearing no cape. Good Lord, some days I'm just holding on with all the grace that God will give me to, to make it. Anybody else who paints a different picture than that is out of step with the Bible itself. Like who in the Bible does that? Right? Like if the apostle Paul saying that, that not that I've already obtained all these things, right? Then, then I think nobody here should be like, I think I've obtained all these things. No, no, we're clinging to Christ, trusting in his grace and believing that his promises are true. So some ways to look at this that I think are really helpful as we're talking about witness. Withness, as we see in this text, being with him, not necessarily living for him, but witness that leads to for him, it, it ensures that our calling and our purpose are true. So, so there's two things that are happening in the passage that I just read. One, that you see that you are reconciled to reconcile. Right? You have been reconciled to God. You've been brought into the presence of Jesus to do what? To help others into the presence of Jesus. Um, I don't know if you've, I've got a couple of friends, they're natural networkers. I don't know if you know that. They still look like they know everybody on earth and they're always, they always want to connect you to other people that they know because they, when they meet you, they're like, oh my gosh, you know who you would love? You would love this person. I think they would love you. I got to get you two together because you two together is going to be incredible. Anybody have a, it's just like every group has that one friend that it seems like they know everyone on earth and, and they're constantly interested in connecting people. Well, what's happening with withness when you're with Christ is you get to be kind of, you're a part of this, hey, I need to introduce you to this friend of mine. I mean, he's going to blow your mind. I mean, this friend that I have, man, I, yeah, I'm, a hang, I'm hanging out with him all the time. He's amazing. I just want to introduce you. Like, he's going to blow you. Like, he's so kind. He's more kind than you could fathom. Like, he's more generous than, than anyone you've ever heard of or read of or have considered. Like, if we were to imagine that the best of everything, he blows past that. I just, man, I'd love to introduce you. I'd love you to, right? We, we're reconciled to reconcile. But also you get, you get your identity here, right? Not only are you reconciled to reconcile, and that means wherever you are, this is what you're doing. But you're also a new creation. You're an ambassador. So wherever you are, this is who you are. So let's chat about this a second. If you're a teacher, praise God on high for you. Thank you for what you do. What a gift you are to human flourishing. But actually... Your new creations, ambassadors of Christ, and wherever you are, you have been reconciled to reconcile. All right? Uh, uh, are you a high entrepreneur? Are you a lawyer? Are you a welder? Are you a handyman? Praise Christ on high for handymen. There are those of us who are completely inept in the rhyme and reasons of taking care of our homes. Without you, we would be in disrepair. Bless you in the name of Jesus. Right? But what you actually are is an ambassador of Christ. You are a new creation, and, and you get to introduce people to Jesus because you're with him. So since you're with him, wherever you are, this is what you're doing. Right? You, you're a teacher. Praise God, we need you. But as you teach, the, the end goal, the ultimate reality is this. And then the, the last thing I want to cover before we um, close out our time together is, is on top of identity and purpose, calling and, and helping make sense of our lives, seeing the story of reality as the story that we're in, we, we get life. I, I love this passage, Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. So path of life, that's the Bible's moral vision for humanity. But How? You fill me with joy where? Or in your presence, there's fullness of joy. So I, I memorized it in the NIV years ago, and now I'm preaching out of the ESV. Does that mess with anybody else sometimes? So I'm quoting the NIV. This is the ESV. Both are wonderful. Uh, and yet, where is joy found? In his presence. And, and so now we have this path of life laid before us, 
that in his presence, full of joy, we're empowered to live for because we've been with. But if you take away the withness, being in his presence with joy, then all you're left with on the path of life is fear, that, that God would be harsh and judge you if you don't, and, and you lack all the eternal pleasures that are at his right hand. So if we could be honest, um, sin has a little bit of a shelf life. What, what, I, what I mean by that is that, that sin tastes good for a little bit, and then it betrays us, then it goes bad, right? Whereas what God is offering you is what never perishes, and so really, really, sin always starts out with a whisper that makes sense. And, I, and, and I've said before, like, if, if you watch how sin works in people, um, it, it's not that, that all of a sudden a demon's going to show up and catch your house on fire, right? Uh, what, what happens is a lie is whispered into your soul. And it's a lie that sounds right. And it's a lie that's tied to some of those compulsions. Like the serpent doesn't bite Eve. He whispers into her ear. Look at the fruit. Isn't the fruit good? Gosh, that fruit, I don't, where I'm sitting, that fruit looks amazing. Why wouldn't God want you to have that? I mean, look, it's good. Look at it with your eyes. And, and then you gotta taste it. It's the sweetest fruit in all of the garden, which is why God doesn't want you to have it. Right? And, and Eve's compulsion is, yeah, he's like that. He's trying to rob me of life. He's trying to take from me, despite the fact the whole flipping garden is hers. Right? The whole garden is hers, and, and the serpent doesn't strike her heel, doesn't pump her full of venom, doesn't kill her. He whispers a lie that sounds right, and she agrees with it, and chaos is introduced. And this passage is saying, no, no, no. The path to life is tied to the joy of his presence and tied to what cannot perish because it's of him. Now, what I want to do as often as I can as one of the elders and lead pastors here is I want to set up as many dates as possible that I can between you and Jesus. I want you to be with him and around him. In fact, I don't know if you've ever even thought about it this way, but when we gather on Sunday morning, it's an exercise of witness. That's what we're doing. We're coming into the presence of Jesus. We're singing. We're praying. We're giving. We're worshiping. We're hearing the word. We're being reminded of the ultimate story of reality. And he's lining us back up with where we were designed to operate, right? We're, this is a practice of witness. And as often as I can create spaces where we can just be with him, we want to do that. Well, one of my favorite places that we started a, a year, maybe a year ago now, it, we just call it Encounter. Um, and encounter is, is Sunday night, man. And so next Sunday night, we'll, we'll be one. And it's, we, we get up here at 5 and 5 to 6.30. Here's all we do. It's crazy. We worship. We pray. We invite the Holy Spirit in to work among us, to break our hearts, to, to stir us up for greater love for Jesus. We pray over our sick. We just ask the Spirit of God to move. It's an exercise in witness. In fact, in the month of October, going back to what I preached on last week, we want to call the whole church the month of October every Sunday night, 5 to 6.30, to gather and ask the Spirit of God to move and to stir and to give us angst for and passion for his name, his renown, and his presence in our lives, in our church, in our community, to the ends of the earth. And so I just want to put that on your radar. Now let me tell you where we're going. The, the rest of the fall we're gonna take some time to lay before you some practices, some disciplines that help and empower witness. Because if you've grown up your whole life with a moral lens, then man, some of this is super discombobulating, right? Because here I am going, these things matter, but they're not the point. And if your whole life has been, I gotta make these things work, then like, how does this whole thing work now if it's just me not looking at porn or not doing this or not doing that, making sure I do that? Like, what does it look like to exercise Withness. Well, the rest of the fall is just areas where, where the Bible has said, hey, the Lord meets his people here. So next weekend, we're going to talk about Sabbath. And, and then the next week, we're going to talk about the role of the scriptures. The weekend after that, we're going to talk about silence and solitude. Then we're going to talk about fasting. We're going to talk about generosity. We're going to talk about service. We're going to talk, and I know like some of these things feel like, well, I mean, this is not, doesn't sound all that exciting of a series. But here's what's incredible. The, the Lord doesn't meet us always just in this kind of spirit sprinkle, euphoric, ecstatic place. He shapes us and he molds us in the quiet. I would even argue 
in the mundane. God, help us in the boring. And that's why last week I said, man, one of the biggest enemies of renewal is distraction. If silence and solitude terrifies you, if you're addicted to distraction, Sabbath, solitude and silence, fasting, quieting the spirit to orient our lives around withness, it, it's near impossible. And, and every week, what we're gonna do is just give you a practice. We're gonna give you homework. It's not gonna be anything crazy. It's gonna be stuff like this. One time this week, have dinner with somebody else who loves Jesus and make the topic of the dinner be Jesus. But like for most people, they're just like, that is ridiculous. <laughs> we, where are we even gonna find those people? <laughs> uh, I hope to your left or to your right. <laughs> right, so they're just gonna be these little practices where, hey, try this. It's an exercise in withness. It's not legalistic. It's not God loves you more if you do or less if you don't. It's just an opportunity to order our lives around things that for many of us are going to feel mundane. They're, they're going to feel boring. They're going to be a challenge of discipline because of their lack of pizzazz. And yet they're the things that shape and have shaped the people of God for millennia. And so I'm excited about continuing to lay this foundation of withness before in January we move into now. Now that we've practiced withness and are practicing withness, now that we understand the redemptive lens versus the moral lens, now that we've exercised and known what it's like to be in his presence, let's follow him.